Uh, very happy to have Dr. Tomoko Matsuo here. Uh, Tomoko received her PhD in Atmosphere Sciences from SUNY uh, Stony Brook, working with Marv Gaylor. Actually, sh she came here as a graduate. Uh, I think you are a Newkirk, right? Newkirk fellow. ASB for SNNU. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And uh, uh, currently, she's a scientist at uh, Sirius at CU Boulder. Uh, and as I just mentioned before that, uh, she was a, a postdoc at uh, Image, and before that at uh, 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 HAO as a graduate student. And uh, Tomoko's uh, uh, research interest is to bridge the gap between numerical models and observations uh, by means of uh, st uh, statistical inference. And uh, with external funding from uh, NASA, NSF, and FOSR, uh, she leads uh, independent modeling and data simulation research uh, in space science, and she's going to discuss data simulation today. Thank you, Hanli. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm very happy to be here. HO is a very special place for me. I was a graduate student, and I had a fantastic experience. I learned a lot about space physics and the upper atmosphere. But more importantly, I learned the joy of doing research. Toward the end of my PhD, I became very interested in something called data assimilation. Even though this word is a very difficult word for me to pronounce, I went on learning more about data assimilation during my postdoc training, including mathematics and the theory behind it. Now, I work on applications of data assimilation to the upper atmosphere. The upper atmosphere is the part of the atmosphere where the Earth's atmosphere meets geospace. It is exposed to weather on Earth and the weather in space. It has a lot of um, imp uh, impact on modern technological systems, including navigation, positioning, and, uh, and, inc and also satellite tracking and space debris tracking. So the predictability of the upper atmosphere is an area of research with important societal relevance. In spite of that importance, societal relevance, it is, uh, this topic is relatively understudied. So I and several colleagues from different disciplines uh, got together and uh, wrote a proposal to, the, to NASA's Heliophysics Grand Challenge Research Program and uh, we are very fortunate to receive funding from NASA amount to $1.2 million to address this very question. This is a recognition that one of grand challenge of our time is in fact the predictability of upper atmosphere and uh, ensemble modeling and the data assimilation is a promising approach. Okay. Today, the rest of today's my talk, I'll focus on what I have been doing using NCAR's model to address this question. So my research goal uh, is to understand intrinsic and pre practical predictability of the upper atmosphere. The approach I'm going to use, I'm using is ensemble modeling and data assimilation. And uh, I'm going to explain what these two approach means in the next slide. Okay. Ensemble modeling is a way to emulate the evolution of probability distribution of a given dynamical system. For, for the, the system we are interested in, the upper atmosphere, that is very forced and the dissipative system, it is important to consider uncertainty in the, in the forcing, as well as forcing uh, uncertainty in the initial conditions. As you can see in uh, this diagram, the idea is simple. The, um, the, so the ensemble split, is it, is it hard to see? Shall I make it dark? Or? Okay, um, idea is simple. Ensemble split, so the reflect the uncertainty of this system. So as time goes, the uncertainty ensemble spread grows time. So data assimilation is 
about making this probability distribution condition on observations and then naturally reduce uncertainty of uh, dy dynamical prediction and then reduce the, uh, reduce the spread of ensemble. Okay, so this is the effect of observations. Okay. So that's ensemble modeling. So data assimilation is statistical methodology that combines models with observations. So everybody is expert in this at ENCA. So there is a model that is very comprehensive. And we, using this numerical model, we have complete description of physical system. It's comprehensive but theoretical. That means it doesn't necessarily reflect what's actually happening right now outside of this room. Okay, so then comes observations, and that's, uh, that reflects what's happening outside. But by nature, observations are incomplete in space and time. So data simulation comes in to combine these two sources of information to, to to get an optimal description of the state of the atmosphere with a consideration of uncertainty associated with observations and also uncertainty associated with models. So that's, so those are the uh, approach I use in my research and uh, I'm going to apply this to the upper atmosphere. The upper atmosphere is partially ionized due to ultraviolet radiation from the sun. Then neutral component part is called thermosphere, and then ionized part is, is called ionosphere. And then ionosphere thermosphere is tightly coupled. And we have a lot of, or relatively abundant, observations for the ionosphere thanks to GPS technologies. Uh, but for the thermosphere, we have very limited observations. So the idea is to use abundant ionospheric observations to infer under-observed thermospheric states. So that is so-called coupled data assimilation, coupled data assimilation approach. That is approach commonly used in or well, used uh, ocean atmosphere coupling. Okay. And then I'm going to explain how coupled data assimilation, how that works for thermosphere ionosphere problems. Data assimilation system I'm, I'm considering here is a cyclic system. So it's made up of forecast step and update step. Update step is actual merging happens, and a forecast step is actually numerical model to integration in time. And then we do the cyclic. Um, cycling of these two steps to, to improve the system estimation throughout the time. So there are two ways to do this. One first approach is so-called weak coupling. The weak coupling, weak, weakly coupled, coupled data assimilation, um, the coupling between thermosphere and ionosphere is only considered in, in a forecast step. And then uh, the, the Guy et al. 2007 and 2008, the work is done actually here in collaboration with Wen Bing and uh, Stan Solomon here. Um, so th th their work actually falls into this category. So, so the, the example was uh, this work was done by using TIE GCM and ionospheric part plasma densities, uh, electron density, and O plus densities are replaced or uh, with uh, assimilation analysis. And then forecast steps takes in and then kicks in and then coupling between thermosphere and ionosphere. It's solved only in a forecast step. And that has a good impact on, a, on a improving the forecast stability of the uh, numerical models. But what I'd like to talk about today is so-called strongly coupled, coupled data assimilation. So as you can see, uh, coupling between thermosphere and ionosphere can be considered in both steps, in the forecast step and assimilation step. Okay, so I've been working on this problem uh, for the last five, six years, and then, and then myself and then a number of collaborators, many of them are students and postdoc. We worked 
together, and then we um, managed to publish uh, about 10 papers on this topic. Some of them are still coming up under review. And uh, so that's what I'm going to talk about uh, from this collaborative work with students and postdoc and scientists at HAL. And uh, okay, so we constructed a uh, couple of data simulation system using HAO's thermosphere ionosphere electrodynamics general circulation model, TIEGCM, and DART. DART is a uh, data simulation research testbed that is developed by Jeff Anderson and his colleagues at uh, Image at Enega. So, so there's a cyclic assimilation system here. It's presented by DART, and then model is TIEGCM, and then we combine observation and model using this. Um, software, but it, we are solving ensemble common pro filter problem here. So for, for the state vector represented here, denoted by x, in this problem is composed of neutral states, neutral winds, neutral temperature and composition, as well as ionospheric states here, electron density and an O plus. So if you add those states, number of states up, the size of state vector become about half a million. So that is the degree of freedom of estimation problem we are after. So it's a called high dimensional estimation problem, which is very challenging. And, and, and then on top of it, the system we are looking at is highly dissipative and forced. So to initialize ensemble of, in this case, TIEGCM, we needed to introduce perturbations through forcing terms. And that's, that's how ensemble got spun up. Um, so, okay, so I talked about weakly coupled, strongly coupled data simulation. So for the, to understand for the rest of my talk, for weakly coupled system, the state vector is going to be composed of only on the ionospheric states. So example I'm going to show next, uh, we assimilate electron density observations, and then electron density observations are used to constrain uh, ionospheric states. So that's a, so my example of weakly coupled data assimilation system. But if you expand uh, state vector to include thermospheric states, which is in this case, in the example I'm gonna show, some states are not observed, but through um, cross covariance between ionospheric states and the thermospheric states, we are able to infer, we will attempt to infer thermospheric states. So, so, if you, okay, so if state vector is composed of only ionospheric states, that is weakly coupled data simulation system. If the state is composed of both thermospheric states, and ionospheric states that's going to be strongly coupled, example of cu strongly coupled data simulation system, okay? So first of all, I'm going to show you a few examples of uh, assimilating cosmic radio occultation. This is retrieved electron density profiles uh, into TIEGCM. And an example I'm gonna show first three slides, it's going to be synthetic observations so that we can assess the performance of a simulation system. Okay, so, um, so we assimilate electron density observations into TIEGCM and then estimate either ionospheric states or both ionospheric and thermospheric states. And then we do assimilation for about 12 hours, one hour cycle. We keep assimilating cosmic observation for, for 12 hours. And then after 12 hours, hours, we stop assimilating observations, and then we launch ensemble forecast. 24 hours, 72 hours, launch the forecast. So this is a, um, initialization is done by assimilation of cosmic observations. Okay. So what you're looking at here is actually the, uh, the work led by a student I've been working with. She's from uh, Taiwan, National Central University, and then Wen Bin and I co-mentored her. Uh, so this is her publication. Uh, okay, so what you're looking at is uh, performance, well, the root mean square error of 
global electron density from the forecast period. So at the time 12 UT, uh, the, all the uh, initialization of TIEGCM is done by assimilation. And then all the different, uh, b different colors represent different filters. So going from, let's say, let's, what, can, can you see this gray line that represents the performance or ensemble forecast of TIEGCM without any data simulation. So that's what happens if you don't have any data. And then the, the smaller the, the, this number error, the, it's, 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 it's forecast, well, we increase the forecastability of this model. Um, so, so there are a bunch of lines. And then so you could see, for example, those blue and red line represent basically weakly coupled data simulation system. Right? And then especially if you only have electron density as a state vector, we, we lose quickly the fo forecast impact of initialization. But important thing is you can cluster those three lines, uh, pink and green and orange. Those are the one that actually the uh, neutral composition is included in state. So those were the one that, that the system that actually have sustained uh, impact of initialization is sustained over 24 hours, and then it's actually going to live for another 24 hours or so. So if you don't have neutral composition in the states, the impact of initialization get lost. So this is a well-known uh, physical uh, coupling between ionosphere and thermosphere, because electron density, well, O plus recombination is is heavily dependent on neutral composition. By estimating neutral composition by um, cosmic electron density observations, we are able to increase uh, for, um, predictive capability of the model. So that impact lasts quite a while. OK, so that is about uh, ionosphere. And then I went on looking at, OK, please. Okay, so I mean, just well. So the question is that um, you want to focus into the future, right? And then we are not, we don't have data in the future in a realistic scenario. So usually you assume up to now and then do the forecast. And then the what we are looking at here is basically practical predictability of the system rather than intrinsic predictability, which is it's more. More physics problem. But, uh, okay, practical predictability comes in as a combined information. The observations bring in information, and then the informed dynamics in the model. So that's what I wanted to see using realistic observations. This at least a distribution of observations. How much? If we know perfectly composition, that that's a different story. Can yeah? So that's what assessing we are assessing in this numerical experiments, please. Forgets about it. Oh, okay. Here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, here. Anyway, it's a. So if. Yeah. Yes, we introduce basically noise, or we force the model out of sort of happy, happy east, well, equilibrium by observations. So, you know, model want to go one direction, and then we pull, okay, electron density, it's actually observations, it's telling you to be here, and then we, you know, then we push that, and then, then let model dynamics to sort of integrate the information. So, what it's showing is that, okay, all of the case, only electron densities are assimilated. So when you, 
so blue case is only pushing electron density. But then every hour. Every hour. Mm -hmm. No, assimilating only here. So assimilated up to here, then then this is the free run. So this is sort of uh, I have been doing recently. I wanted to see can we this, does this help? Does this exercise actually help the predictability of the dynamic gas system we are looking at? I think we are more familiar with the idea of preconditioning. So impact of preconditioning of the thermosphere on the ionosphere. So that's what we're looking at. And then we know this physics, but then so it's showing with using actual models. Okay. So good. So now I wanted to see if this, I guess I'm claiming that this is helping constraining thermospheric states, but I wanted to see if that's really helped to, to estimate uh, neutral mass density. That's one of the projects that I was on from Air Force that got funded. Uh, funded me, my research. So what you're looking at here is the same experiment. <laughs> at the end of 12 hours assimilation cycle, I have a look at how neutral mass densities get uh, estimated. Okay. So again, we're only assimilating electron densities. So we're inferring something that's not observed. So here, this case, longitude, latitude, you're looking at the uh, uh, mass den error in mass density. Because we introduce a fo uh, forcing perturbations in the high latitudes, so we have higher error in the high latitude. And then if we have very strongly coupled data simulation system, we estimate um, temperature, winds, and compositions. We are able to reduce error significantly. And uh, so that's, a, that's, a, that's what happened. And then I wanted to see a bit more detail in somewhere in between. So, so this, interestingly, uh, the impact of neutral mass density estimation is, is mostly coming from neutral temperature. So cosmic data is able to tell what the neutral temperature should be. It, it more, because this is a profile data, so HMF2 has information about some sort of temperature. And then, so if we, so if we, ha if we only estimate plasma density plus neutral composition, neutral temperature, we're able to get comparable uh, estimate or reduction in error in neutral mass density. <laughs> okay, please. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, it's case by case, and actually we've been looking at dependence on solar cycles and then seasons, and it's, it's, uh, it, it changes. I mean, in this case, this is a equinox quiet case. It's the, the kind of fast test you do with this kind of new system. The impact of neutral winds are relatively small, but then in a different case, uh, we had a bit more impact on, from neutral winds and then well, vice versa. So we are analyzing that result right now. But it, it is true, Gan. This is an idealized case and then, and then it's really best possible scenario. Well, so we are synthetically generating cosmic observations and, and then we know the truth. But what we did is, is that really um, we introduced error in a, in a control run. So the uh, sort of ensemble that we use to assimilate these observations are not centered on the truth. So, th so it's not, it, model is not bias free. So we are able to correct bias. The real test is we have to use, uh, uh, you have to sample from different model. Mm -hmm. Okay, please. Sorry, this is, has to be O plus. plus. Some other slide that says O plus. Sorry, this says O. Yeah. So it's O plus and T. It seems that's very good, uh, even better than when you assimilate directly the neutral uh, components uh, in the uh, lower center uh, panel, where you show the you assimilate directly composition. The, neutral, the mm -hmm. composition. Mm -hmm. It seems this one is not as good as as just assimilating temperature. I wonder why. Okay. So. 
So previously, to see the impact on uh, ionospheric forecasting, it, the improvement is coming from the fact that we, we are able to bring neutral composition close to the so-called truth. But, but for neutral, this is neutral mass density. Mass density is a function of neutral temperature and composition. And I'm, I'm integrating air in height. So, so in that global sense, the, the impact is mostly coming from neutral temperature. If you see a bit lower, you know, centered on a lower altitude, the composition, getting the composition right matters. It, it's slightly different. I was just showing a sort of global picture. So it's, it, it has a lot more details, but it, I found it interesting that neutral mass density improvement come from the fact that we can estimate neutral temperature. But it's interesting this, this system can help to infer composition and neutral temperature. And then, OK, so in the next slide, I'm going to show you the forecast. So again, assimilation is data has been assimilated up to UT12, and then forecasts get launched for 24 hours. And then you could see the filter that con the estimated neutral temperature had be better performance. So this is the forecast. The previous slide is a specification or initialization. So when this filter, well, when this forecast longer than uh, 24 hours, it's now 72 hours, and I'm only showing three cases that have, both has neutral temperature uh, in a, in a part, as a part of state vector. And then uh, you can see, so let's compare dark green one that has a neutral wind on top of temperature and composition. So you can see that uh, there is impact of neutral wind uh, initialization at the beginning of this forecast period, but that information get lost. I mean, it's a, it's, we are just looking at the dynamical time scale versus chemical time scale. So this, this all makes sense physically. But you could see amount of observation we have. This is what we can do, yeah, the best, best possible scenario. And then when this storm happens, when a solar, big solar storm happens, the story changes, because I'm not really taking into consideration of forcing. But then this is, a, I believe this is the important work to understand the impact of preconditioning on a, on a forecast uh, predictability of the numerical models that we heavily use by community. Okay, so that's the part of the um, work that I have done. I'm gonna, I'm showing with uh, synthetic observations, okay. And then uh, the next part, I'm showing you. Uh, so again, assimilated cosmic uh, electron density profiles. In this case, we simulated real uh, uh, data into the TIE GCM. And then I wanted to see this really helped uh, uh, neutral mass density specification. So, so simulated and then estimated neutral um, temperature and compositions. And then from assimilation analysis, I could I recomputed Champ neutral mass density. So Champ is um, the Leo orbiting satellites, and then it has a very accurate accelerometer. From that accelerometer, the, the, the Champ gives an estimate of neutral mass density about 300 kilometers in the atmosphere. So Champ precedes in orbit, uh, in, you know, so very slowly in time. So for the time I have looked at, 2008, uh, end of 2008, CHAMP was in near local new midnight orbit. So I collected the uh, uh, CHAMP data over the course of two days, which amounts to about 15 orbits, and then compared against uh, CHAMP observations, and then against uh, TIE GCM prediction, and then data simulation analysis. I computed the difference. And then, and then uh, combined, and, and then in terms of latitude. Um, so what you so I'm, I separated. This is a midnight one, midnight track, and then this is the results summary plot from uh, noon track. So you could see. Uh, so oh, the error. So you're looking at the error. So it's not absolute, okay. So you're looking at the error, and then so, so you can see blue is control. So that's when you don't assimilate any data. 
So that's a pure TIE GCN performance. And then we assimilate cosmic observations. You could reduce the error in the TIGCM prediction of neutral mass density. So this is a comparison against real data. So I simulated real cosmic observations, and then I'm comparing against uh, real CHAMP observations. And CHAMP data is now assimilated in this case. Okay, so this is a verification. Uh, it's, the system is, is working, and uh, we could build upon it. Hi. It's a, it's a, it's a small, like a, like a five, ten percent. So, but then this is a global sense. I was, just, yeah, I was, a, so you could, I also did the experiment really assimilating CHAMP data, and then I could see the, to see the impact, but it's a limited uh, along the CHAMP track. Of course, here I only had to compare where the CHAMPs are, but, um, so this is the error reduction that you gain globally. And then this is the verification and the validation that only can do where the champs are. But definitely, we could, if we assimilate the real data, the champ data, we can actually, along the satellite track, we can reduce error more because we can, that's more direct information about neutral mass density. But I was struggling that what is more useful if you want to reduce the error, error globally, abundant less direct observation that is that you know how that useful to reduce the error, the global error in a, in a, this case, uh, neutral temperature. Well, if if your aim is just to to get the better estimate along the satellite track, then of course assuming it to some city and then we get a lot more uh, reduction in error. So that's. This, this comparison is just showing the effect of assimilating electron density data and estimating the neutrals. Right, so right. It's small effect because the electron densities are, are very small. There's information in the electron density as to what the neutrals are doing, but the driving is really the other way around. Right, exactly, yeah. That's why we need to understand the neutrals. Exactly. Okay. Right. So, and so in the previous list, you could see that this could help ionosphere, but I wanted to see if this actually really making an atmosphere closer to real observations. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Like it didn't, it didn't break what's working. So, okay. So I think it, I think it, this strategy helps to sort of bring the bias global bias a bit smaller if we could make this work all the time and then then assimilate more direct observations where we have um, I, I, I'm very excited to do something like that when some observation like a gold mission comes around that we have a lot more data because uh, you have observation along the satellite track, or well, FBI data here, uh, neutral data are so patchy, and then impact is small, and then it's just the domain, you know, it's, it's satellite moves around, it's very difficult. And that's, uh, well, I should have done it, but I, I just expect that that impact to be small. So I, this, I was surprised that I got positive response. Here. <laughs> So, okay, so next, uh, so this is a, uh, okay, so now we've been assimilating uh, cosmic radio occultation observation, retrieved data, and then I want to show that we can actually assimilate uh, ground-based GPS data, which is uh, the in, uh, tech, info, tech data into the system, and then so assimilated global tech data into TIE GCM. So we have a lot of data coming from GPS, and that's, uh, it, it is really great. We have a lot of data, but this is vertically integrated quantity. So this is a very difficult inverse problem. And then again, the same uh, thing that I've been telling, assimilating very indirect 
uh, information to the electron density, we want to estimate the thermospheric states that's not observed. And in this case, predicted, so estimate, assimilated, estimated all the neutral states and the ionospheric states, and then predicted uh, O2 and 2 ratio, which is a composition at the uh, t uh, timed Gooby uh, location. And then, uh, so, so this is a actually work led by Alex Chalier and then Gang Lu was a, um, was a colla uh, was collaborator on this. Uh, so we, he, this experiment, we real data is assimilated and then this is actually storm time. So it's a, a lot harder and it really worked. There's a still issue in a model bias, but what you're seeing is before assimilation and then after assimilation, you could see that the assimilation of ground-based GPS data bring neutral composition um, in overall closer to what's been observed. So this is a sort of um, proof of concept and also validation that the system is is doing what we hope that to be doing. So there's a theory part that it should help, but then this is a validation that it's actually doing the right thing. Okay. Unfortunately, this wasn't included in a, in a final Alex paper that came out last year in JGL because reviewers didn't like it. So, okay. So, so, so far I've been, well, Today, I have talked about uh, the upper atmosphere and then coupling between the thermosphere and the ionosphere. By using ionospheric observations, we have lots of ionospheric observations, we are able to constrain the thermospheric states. And then um, what we have learned so far is um, we can infer under, under observed thermospheric states, neutral wind, composition, and temperature by assimilating abundant electron density observations. By doing that, we are able to extend the forecast capability of uh, numerical models, some sort of ionosphere coupled model. So that's so, uh, one lesson, and that's a useful tool. So up to now, I've been talking about, OK, there are not enough observations, and then, you know, especially in some sphere, we have limited data, but that, it's going to change. It's about to change. Um, so there are a couple of new satellite missions coming up. It's a very exciting time. Uh, so here, Stan Solomon and then Alan Van here, they are involved with NASA's Explorer mission, uh, no, Mission of Opportunity mission, Gold mission, uh, scheduled to launch next year to in September, but then it's gonna take a bit more time to satellite to get to geostationary orbit and then from geostationary orbit they make a, make a image of FUV image of thermosphere. From that uh, mission we will get uh, composition information and neutral temperature information. So that's it's very exciting and then ICO mission that's that's a mission of um, but explorer mission, and that's equatorial plane. It's more, it provides more in situ observations. And then, and then follow on cosmic mission, cosmic two. And then uh, as the phase one uh, is, is uh, composed of six micro satellites in uh, equatorial planes. And I'm gonna provide a lot more radio occultation observations. And then uh, cosmic two mission, and together we're gonna have uh, four times more sounding than what we had on the cosmic one. So those are the very exciting time. So these satellite missions present a very exciting opportunity for upper atmosphere data assimilation. For the first time, we are able to, we're going to have more than enough observations to constrain the model dynamics so that we can extend the uh, predictive capability of numerical models. So imagine we will have a single seamless integrated system extending from the ground to space that assimilate all these observations. So in a tropospheric numerical weather prediction, they assimilate about 40 million of data every six hours. And then 
we ha there's a debate that what kind of assimilation cycle we have to use, but if you actually integrate over the six hours, we're going to have quite significant amount of observations that we can actually come close or getting closer to what the, the type of amount of observation that go into the uh, troposphere and the stratosphere. <coughs> so it will be a game changer if you're able to do this. And now we are entering in the age of commercial space transportation. Understanding what's happening in the whole atmosphere extending from ground to space is crucial to this effort. The atmospheric conditions affect re-entry and descent and the landing of suborbital and orbital vehicles. If we can predict, we can understand and predict the condition of atmosphere, the whole atmosphere, we can actually contribute to make this new age of new, this new age of space travel uh, um, open up. So it might help you or your neighbors and then your children get to space and come back from space safely. When I was a little child, little girl, growing up in tiny village in Japan, I dreamed about becoming an astronaut. So now I want my research to help space travel become a possibility for everyone. Thank you very much. Questions for Tomoko? You don't mean that NASA is going to do commercial flights, right? This is it. Yeah, so that was a, the, yeah, no. So that's why it's a blood out. I, <laughs> no, NASA gave away the, all the technology. Yeah. Questions? So the improvement when you uh, simulated the electron density, you got a sort of a 5% improvement globally. I, I mean, the, do you think that the fundamental um, or the major problem with the, with or um, or source of error or error growth was that the TIGCM is just has a bad lower boundary condition and you're not assimilating the lower atmosphere and getting the waves propagating up. Is that what's putting a permanent floor on your uh, you know where you cannot go below that level when you assimilate the there's it. Thank you. So there are a number of model biases. So the model doesn't have, you know, it has um, lower boundary conditions that it's it's uh, hard to estimate. You know, there are no data going in to constrain that. And then there's a way maybe you can use uh, reanalysis, like uh, work has been done here. So that's one source. And then I upper boundary flux O plus. It's again the model boundaries because those are the sub system model. So my hope is that we, as a community, we build in this coupled system and then be able to bring those um, unsolved physics into the model. So that way we can reduce uh, model bias uncertainty. And then, but then I had, I have seen a lot of uh, diurnal cycle is not well uh, captured. So diurnal cycle is weaker in neutral mass density in, in TIEGCM. And then model is not enough to 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 wash, you know bring down a uh, bias. Uh, one, yeah, so there are a number of biases. I see systematic model bias that we can. If I have time, I like to actually go in and then change it. We looked at the collision frequencies and then plasma drifts and stuff. And then we one by one we should be able to bring the model bias corrected. And also, you know, in, in, I mean, that's more fundamental way, but they could also estimate four things, which I didn't show today. And then uh, it's a lot trickier to do than state estimations, but we can estimate those parameters in a model four thing from, from observations as well. That's one way to reduce uh, model uh, bias. But, okay. Mm -hmm. So uh, you're looking at how using the data assimilation enables you to better forecast hours or many days out, is what I saw, and and so, but it must that how that works must depend on the solar wind conditions, different driving conditions. You might be able to do better during quieter times and not mm -hmm. as well during longer mm -hmm. times during 
more stormy times. Have you looked into this very much yet? Or so it, it is difficult. You know, it's it's almost like a volcanic system that we don't know when it's erupt, and then we need we need to be able to you know system need to be able to cope with basically huge regime shifts, and. Uh, uh, so what we need, what I'm doing in, a, in a actually using NOAA's model and a different uh, uh, from NASA funding, we're looking at uh, uncertainty of drivers, looking at the uh, uh, SDO data, and then see the range of variability, and then that's how we actually pre, um, produce ensembles, so they have enough range in the ensembles, realistic uh, error associated with forcing variability or forcing range. If ensemble has enough spread, and then I have to probably make that dependent on, we, we need some sort of I mean, in, you know, forecasting information, but then if you have that realistic perturbation model, perturbation means a stochastic model of EUV, and then magnetos magnetospheric forcings, we are able to cope that we are able to push this entire ensemble system, okay, storm happens. Now, if this range, if the ensemble is populated in a totally different uh, regime, we are not able to cope with it. And then uh, it's difficult. And then uh, it's, uh, um, it's going to be, you know, that's a fundamental problem of our system. So but then we can get, we can cope with, we are, we are working to cope with that situation. Um, in your uh, digestion dart assimilation, your um, assimilation cycle you mentioned 60 minutes. Do you um, is that your optimum assimilation cycle, and how how do you decide? Or in other words, what happens if you take uh, a smaller or larger assimilation cycle? Mm. It's a very good question, and we have experimented uh, longer and then shorter window. And then if we have a lot of data, it, it, because of time scale of ionosphere, especially storm time, it makes sense to reduce the assimilation cycle. And then the performance gets better. So what happens is uh, basically we keep correcting the model state closer to observations. And if the assimilation cycle is too large, and then, so the system more model error growth gets into the direction that, that you know, unconstrained for too long. And then, then after one hour, we, we bring observations and it's difficult to bring it back. But if you actually assimilate more rapidly, we, we are able to bring it closer. So that's the case with GIE, GCM. But then in the case of whole atmosphere, the, the, it's, it, this is some question that I'm really try to answer using NOAA's whole atmosphere model. It's, it's a, I think the question is up in the air because there's a dynamical error growth or natural instability that grows in a, in a, in a, in a, in a whole atmosphere. So troposphere, the, the, the dynamical time scale, especially synoptic scale, is a lot longer. So that's why they chose six hours to be optimal assimilation cycle. And then in the ionosphere, thermosphere, we want to assimilate more rapidly. But it is a coupled system. We cannot just do, OK, assimilate here six hours and assimilate here. So we're going to introduce unwanted instability. So, so it's a good question, and it has to be investigated. And then for ionosphere, thermosphere, if you have lots of data, especially from ground-based GPS, the rapid cycling helps. And then I think in the troposphere, they are, if they are looking at some sort of regional scale, the rapid cycling seems to really help. So it depends what you look at. Questions? I have a question. So uh, earlier I asked a question. You know the uh, the uh, what impact the predictability or the error growth, mm -hmm. uh, and you showed that temperature obviously is very important mm -hmm. and uh, makes sense because it determines the you know species and or the density and also the wind. Uh, I was wondering, uh, just from those uh, three missions you just mentioned, and any of those retrieve neutral temperature? And you can assimilate. I'm in, I'm been I've been asking Stan Solomon yeah. this question, but gold does measure temperature, but yes. that's called effective temperature. And then try to and get it, my heads heads around. And it covers the whole. Yes. Yeah. Construct. So, but then it, it so I'm working really hard to be able to 
make best use of that information. And then, so it's a, it's a really difficult inverse problem. And then, um, so there's a different approach to solve that inverse problem. So gold measures effective temperature or pro pro integrated information. So we don't know the temperature at this height. And then, um, so we need a, some sort of, we need a work. We need a wait, waiting kernel uh, to sort of bring it back to to estimation of temperature at that specific location. That's what model needs. We cannot, yeah. And then, and then ensemble system does it in a, it solve this inverse problem in a different way. And then 3D bar solve it in a different way. Well, different method solves it in a different way. And then, so that's something we have to hopefully work it out in the next few years or till gold start producing data. And then what I'm really excited about is something called hybrid method, hybrid of uh, 3D bar and an ensemble method. So maybe you can take the best of, you know, best of both and then maybe find an optimal way of inversing uh, precious gold data <laughs> and then get. The, the, the gold temperature measurement is, it's a little like the Goovy O to N2 measurement. You know, people always ask, well, what is, what is Goovy O to N2 mean? Mm -hmm. Goovy O to N2 is that thing that Goovy measures, right? <laughs> and, and in order to assimilate it, you have to simulate what it is that, what it is that the model thinks is, quote, mm -hmm. Goovy O to N2. And it's a similar problem with temperature where you, have, where you have measurement over a line of sight or over a column. I think in the meantime, probably the most effective things that you could do with temperature if you, there, there are ways of estimating the global mean exospheric temperature, which is just a key Product. parameter okay. mm -hmm. of, for the whole, you know, for just mm -hmm. the, temp, you know, the, the, the mean state of the atmosphere. And then, of course, the other thing that you mentioned that's come up a couple times is uh, just getting the day to night gradient correct, which the model doesn't do perfectly. And, and, and that's also estimable from data like CHAMP. Mm -hmm. you have typically a day orbit and a night orbit. And so I think with you know, a couple of very simple parameters like mm -hmm. that could be amenable to a, a, a very large scale assimilation that would probably improve model skill without, mm -hmm. without going to a great deal of, of uh, calisthenics having to do with complex measurements, because temperature is not an easy thing to measure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks, Stan. So I think it, especially reducing the model error, I think we probably should look at those parameters that it's more e easy to e assimilate into the model. And then, um, and then we've been working hard to, to, to actually incorporate your GLOW model in a, in a forward model so that we can assimilate emission. <laughs> Um, and that's a, it's a challenging, but then in the long run, that's the way to go to maximize return from mission. That, yeah. Okay. I have another question. So you mentioned at the beginning uh, intrinsic predictability versus uh, practical instability. I mean, practical uh, predictability. And uh, and in the talk, you mainly was uh, talking about the latter, right? The practical. Uh, predictability. Mm -hmm. So uh, how about the intrinsic? Do you have, you know, do you study that or what's the relation? How do so, you use that? Yeah, so I have been looking at it. We have, we, as a team, we start looking at it. And then that's sort of, we like to look at the instability, for example, in a, in a topospheric weather front. And then how that actually error propagates throughout the system. And then we're looking at, uh, the principal components or local uh, singular value decomposition and then how that actually grows over time and space. So that's more approach that taken in a more in a, you know, ensemble modeling, using, not using data simulation at all. So analyze ensemble in, in an easiest way is just look at the spread of ensemble, but also look at a bit more details, what is uh, fast growing error mode and you know, where the source is. I mean, interested in uh, the vertical growth of error. And then, uh, so that, you know, that's one way. And then if you have a lot simpler model, uh, we could, you know, could do analytical, mo if, if you have analytical simpler model, we could do a lot more. But then I'm, more, I'm, more, I'm interested in using numerical models. And then we, we have, um, 
the, so that the strategy is sort of like if we strategy is that which, which I haven't done, and then I think it's a very challenging. But then if you have, uh, if you can numerically linearize the model, uh, we can study a lot about model error growth in a more fundamental way. Uh, so if you have a tangent linear model like uh, ECMWF and then other numerical big center has those, and then we can study those. Uh, error growth in a, in a system, or where the instability is and how that grows. So that's more the intrinsic predictability of atmospheric dynamical system that, that I, I'm learning from um, meteorological field. And uh, I, I think we, we need that kind of tool. And that's a, it's, a, it's a definitely a big project and a big work. But um, maybe down the line, uh, maybe there's some resource, or maybe simplified version of some, or model that we can develop linearized or tangent linear and adjoint that we can study the uh, intrinsic predictability using numerical model. So, so doing part that I can do, but then part the part that it needs a bit more uh, more work. Okay. Okay, no more questions, so let's uh, thank Tomoko again. Thank you very much.